Today we're going to be having a look at this very large HP ProLiant DL580 Gen 3. This machine came out in 2005 and has a fascinating approach to modularity on the front panel here. We can see it's got a huge tray for its four Xeon processors and several of these memory boards. This allowed for mirrored memory, hot swapping, and active failover in the case of physical issues with the memory chips. We're going to open this thing up, take a look around, get it fired up, and then we're going to get a 2005 LAMP stack going on it so we can install some forum software. Let's get into it. Let's have a look at how you get in this thing. So of course on the top, really nice matte sticker with all the instructions that are relevant to pulling the different modular pieces out. Any enterprise server worth its salt will have something like that, so that's nice. And then this is gonna seem trivial, but this lid is the best one I've ever used. So have this little latching mechanism comes up and the sliding action on this thing is really, really nice. It's very easy, it's very smooth and uniform. And if we take it out, of course, this is one big hunk of metal, super heavy. And let me show you why that lid works so well. On the side where the lid comes in contact with the case, these look like bearings, but they're actually just little half domes of metal. And they allow the lid to have just enough separation from this piece to slide really nicely. Let me show you the other side. You can see they're just little half dome pieces of metal all along where the case comes in contact with the lid and it works really nicely. I know it seems odd to go on and on about that lid, but it's the nicest one I've ever interacted with. Super nice attention to detail. So here we're following the typical color scheme, this red or maroon color maybe, means this item can be pulled while the machine's running. Blue indicates the machine has to be off, so the PCR cards can't pull those out with the machine on. These little screws here are for this whole cage assembly to come out. We're gonna do that to get some dust out of the way. Let's look at these fans. These also have a really nice mechanism, so I don't know if you can tell, but it takes me very, very little effort to pull those out. It's got this pull handle that unlatches them from the bottom. Really, really nice. Super easy to work with. Down in here, we've got the spots for two PSUs. And then over on the bottom right, we've got the area for the PCI cards. Toolless entry as well, so you can press in there and this little guy flips up, super easy. These blanks have a nice lip right there, which actually hooks. So when you go to put them back on, they kind of hook right there and stay in place and it gives you time to push this down. You don't have to use two hands, it's pretty nice. And now these two guys, which don't have corresponding PCI slots, were a bonus addition. They called it the mezzanine in the documentation for some reason. And I, basically this configuration could have two more slots. Either would have used this or maybe this connector down here, not sure, some sort of daughter board here. This machine, of course, doesn't have that. A little closer in on the board, we've got the HP logo 2005. Down in here, we've got a row of status LEDs and there's more throughout the main board. So that's really nice. I'll show you those when we power it on. Over on the left here, we've got a slot labeled SO DIM. So not sure what that's for. I'll have to look that up in the documentation. And here we have an interesting slot labeled RILOE-2. This is another remote management card you could plug into this thing in addition to the one that's on board. Shifting the unit around, we've got more instructions and locations of everything, really cool how to take out that system cage I was showing you with those blue screws. Over here, some status indicators. These are on a nice HP branded daughter board. It's actually got some 0304 date codes. So maybe this exact same daughter board was used in previous ProLiant generations, perhaps. Around front, I am happy to report we are fully loaded with four 36.4 gigabyte, 10,000 RPM SCSI drives. I think that would have been the minimum drive size this machine would have come with. Let's get these out. We've got four Compaq branded drives. These three appear to be identical in terms of make and model. This one's an odd man out, but they're all 36.4 gigs. Even as late as 2006, when this exact machine was built, even though the model came out in 05, you still had Compaq and HP branded parts intermingling in these ProLiance. So it always makes me wonder how much of the design was just stuff Compaq was already working on. And you know, you had that inertia, even though the main board's HP branded, and you know, how much was HP influenced and kind of interesting to think about. These of course are Compaq branded sleds. That was pretty typical in the ProLiance for a long time. They have what I would consider 
a flaw. So it's pretty typical that rust builds up here, and I think I have a theory as to why. So if you think about how two of them would sit in the machine together, if we flip this one over, that's where we're seeing that rust. And on the corresponding side, you've got this clip, gives it pressure and holds it steady when it's in there. And I think this thing just fills up with gunk and therefore moisture. <laughs> and so over time, you get this buildup of dust, moisture can get trapped in there and it eventually manages to rust the bottom side of the one it's made it up against. You can see we have a little bit of that starting here. This is particularly bad. Let's see what the other ones are like. That one's looking pretty clean. This one's looking pretty bad. And this one's like just absolutely full of gunk. So it was probably causing issues. So yeah, a little bit, a little bit of a design flaw. I suppose though in a proper data center, you wouldn't have all this dust buildup. Back in there, you can see we're dirty, but not, not too dirty. We'll get all this cleaned up and the back plane is just a normal SCSI 3. And I can see it is dated 2003. So that also would have been shared with previous ProLiant generations. This machine is capable of holding four processors. I am fortunate enough to, I believe, have all four. So we've got this sort of protection guard because you, this is blue, of course, so you can't be pulling that out when the machine's running. One little last warning there. This whole thing has a really pretty hefty handle and it's big. The whole mechanism slides out. The same clip used to unlatch it from the front of the case unlatches the lid. And inside we've got four Xeon processors. We'll pull these out individually when we clean this board. There's quite a bit of dust in here. In fact, I already had to pull out some that was totally egregious when I booted it up for the first time. But yeah, I think we're fully loaded. We've got all four regulators. We've got all four CPUs. Let's take a look at the back connector. Look at this thing. The interconnect to get all four CPUs powered and their data lines running. We've got spots for guide pins that are in the back of the case there. Yeah, pretty impressive the size of this machine, the scale of it. Like I was saying, there's the connector way back in there. You can see the guide pins so that you don't mess it up and mangle all the connectors. And now we finally get to one of the reasons I bought this machine and was so interested in it. We've got four sleds for RAM. In my case, I've got two blanks, unfortunately. Those slide out like so. And then the real ones, you can lock them so that you can't take them out. Get them both unlocked here. Very similar latch to the hard drives. This whole thing comes out. And if we have a look here at the LED indicators on the front of these things, they're labeled spare, mirrored, and RAID. Now, what could that mean? Let's have a look inside of one of these things. So this machine comes with what HP deemed advanced memory protection or AMP features. So in addition to ECC or error code correcting server RAM, let's see what we got here. Ooh, 4G maybe, that'd be nice. So this machine has super interesting memory configurations. Within a module, you can set up what's called mirrors so you can have these two guys being your real RAM, these two guys being exact copies so that when something bad goes wrong with your live ones, it just hot swaps over to the spares. That's one setup. Another one is called hot plug memory and it mirrors everything in one live board over to a spare board. So if something goes wrong with this one, it'll immediately start using this one. I can pull this one, perform service, put it back in and the OS has no idea. And the last most impressive one is the RAID mode. Somehow it gives the OS 75% of available RAM and 25% is left over for parity checking and stuff. Really, really impressive. So we're definitely gonna see if we can get one of those modes working. Let's see what we got in this other one. Looks like two one gig sticks. That's less exciting. OEM HP branded though. So this machine isn't terribly dirty, but you'll, you'll see it's a little dirty, but this dust will just fly off with a brush. So I'm going to clean these while they're out. A little before action on this one. And after. Doesn't seem like much, but you'll have to trust me. It's a lot better. Well, while we are cleaning these things and have them open, I'd also like to max them out. One of them came with two one gig sticks. These are DDR2 sticks, by the way. And one of them came with two four gig sticks. So that's kind of a weird <laughs> combo. I didn't have any DDR2 RAM until about a week ago. A viewer, Matt, sent me 
a pretty nice pile of two gig sticks, I think also from an old ProLiant. So Matt, thank you if you're watching. But I also picked up a huge pile of four gig sticks on eBay at roughly the same time. I think what I wanna do, because we're gonna do this mirroring or sparing where the OS is only gonna get half of the RAM available. We're gonna use these four gig sticks, try to max this out and see how that goes. I'll save these two gig sticks for another project, probably the IBM P5, definitely gonna be putting them to good use. But the eBay seller, of course, just shipped them in this bag with too many of them and we have an issue. Hear that rattling? Why would RAM be making that noise? Because some of the microscopic capacitors, surface mount caps, were banged off a few of the sticks during transit. So I'm gonna look through these and try to determine which ones are not damaged. Though it's kind of funny, they might still work. <laughs> uh, but yeah, maybe we'll get lucky. These are all four gig sticks. I'm gonna try to find enough good looking ones, hopefully find the ones that these are from, so I know which ones I should not be using. And I'll be back. Out of my 10 DDR2 sticks from the eBay seller, three are pretty banged up. So you can see there's a capacitor right there. That's a good stick. And on one of them that got damaged, of course, we have a capacitor missing. And it's one of these guys. Okay, now that I've thoroughly confused the situation, the stuff from eBay won't work. The stuff from Matt will. So, two four gig sticks in here that came with the machine. Hope they work. And then we've got four two gig sticks in here for a total of eight on each side. Don't know if it's gonna like that configuration. I don't even know if any of this RAM works, but we'll do our best. Matt, thanks for sending this my way. He let me know this came from a Gen 5 ProLiant. So it's back home, so to speak. Wanted to make another note about why this RAM mirroring is gonna be so interesting. So server memory is usually something called ECC. You can see it says it here, error code correcting. And basically it's able to withstand certain types of memory storage errors, long story short. This is an ECC one gig stick. This is a conventional one gig stick that you'd have in like your home PC. And you can see there's just literally more chips. <laughs> They're both one gig, but the server style has literally more chips on it. It uh, has a ninth chip and that's for parity. Uh, and it uses that to see if something else has gone wrong in what it's stored at retrieval time, is my understanding. Uh, that's not a tutorial, it's a gross oversimplification, but typically a server would just use ECC, and instead of getting a fault and crashing like this memory will, when an issue happens, the server will keep on trucking. This AMP stuff, advanced memory protection from HP, takes it one step further with like the hard drive RAID style mirroring, so I'm excited to try that out. You might be thinking mirroring memory, RAIDed RAM, isn't this a little overkill? Well, we have to remember what a typical deploy and operations flow might have looked like in 2005. If I'm an enterprise, this might be the only one of these I have running in production. If I'm lucky, I've got a dev box, probably the older machine that this replaced during an infrastructure upgrade. Might look something like this. Imagine I'm Clab Retro Enterprises in 2005. I'm slapping a CR Prod 1 label on the new one, a CR Dev 1 label on the old one, and this is my setup. I'm developing and hopefully testing on this one before I release it into production on this one. And this includes hand rolling OS updates on both of these. Over time, of course, we start experiencing drift. The database on the dev one might be newer with more features. The dev one is getting library and OS updates more often because it's safer to do there. And over time, I'm learning the nuances and preferences of each of these machines as I figure out how to efficiently operate them. Now, fast forward to the end of the 2000s, and a huge paradigm shift is in full force. AWS and other cloud providers have come out with cloud offerings and they've abstracted this hardware away from us nearly entirely. Now I have a programmatically generated production VM up in the cloud with an auto-generated name and AWS has protected us from a lot of the physical underlying hardware failures that can take place. And there are failures. The cloud is just someone else's data center after all. But now in the cloud, I've got a production VM and if it needs to be restarted for hardware or other reasons, I just kill it. I spin up a new one with another name that I don't care about and I run my workload there. And now I start thinking, hmm, it really sucked when I was doing that OS update and my database went down. I should take that out of the VM and put it on other managed infrastructure. Then I really start thinking, hey, it kind of sucks when I perform a library or OS update and I kill the VM 
to update my accounts receivable software and my payroll stuff goes down. I should start splitting those up and running those on other workloads and so on and so on and so on. So not only have we been abstracted away from much of the physical failures that can take place, we've also in the same turn re-architected our software to be more resilient to the hardware, the virtual hardware in the cloud coming and going anyway. So now back to 2005 and this thing. AWS's EC2 VM service wouldn't come out in public beta until 2006, a year after this thing went to market. Docker, a tool which helped make containerization popular and slicing up your app and modularizing things that way, wouldn't come out until 2013, eight years after this thing came to market. So this isn't meant to be like an exhaustive overview of 2000 software deploy and operations. There's a million ways to deploy software. There were folks using these physical machines orchestrating in cloud-like fashions with microservices well before the cloud services made it more approachable for other people. And of course, this is still a legit setup. A dev box, a prod box, a good solution is usually just one that solves your problem after all. But for a business owner, these memory protection features theoretically save them from another failure mode that could take their business offline and thus lose them money. It's just like all the other redundant features in these things, multiple hard drive, multiple fans, multiple PSUs. When we don't have the cloud abstracting all that away from us, we do have to worry about that redundancy down to the physical server level. So if I'm a business owner in 2005 running one or more of these, that's a pretty interesting feature set. When we assess the feature sets of these servers, it's really important to immerse ourselves inside the context in which they would have been designed and built. Were these memory features successful? I don't know. I know I have too much more modern servers that don't offer it. I think these days it's probably more practical to literally just buy more servers for redundancy. But I hope you can see now why something as complex as memory raid and memory mirroring would have been compelling back then. I'm going to get the dust out of this CPU tray for obvious reasons. I might even take it upstairs in the garage and hit it with the air compressor. Ah, my old buddy had one last hurrah in him. This is looking a lot better. It's a lot dustier everywhere else now, but I think this is complete. In case you're wondering how much dust we've accumulated on the bench so far, that was one quick wipe with that. Having a look at the back, two built-in NICs, serial, USB, VGA, PS2 mouse and keyboard, ILO, integrated lights out manager. Definitely going to be playing with that. I've never used HP's version, and this would be one of the very first iterations of it, so that'll be cool. It's going to be very interesting to see what it's like to use this one versus the Compaq remote management board from the first gen ProLiant I have. Decided to do a compare and contrast to that one. Unfortunately, we only have one power supply. Comes out, of course, and it's big. Pretty beefy unit. Now, I didn't notice this when I bought it. It's got like the higher voltage, higher amp style connector. I think it's called a C19 connector. But the good news is, if we take a look at the specifications here, it is more than happy to accept 110 volts in at 12 amps. That's just a normal North American wall plug, and we'll just get a little less wattage out, but that's no big deal for our use case. To that end, I've just picked up one of these adapter cables, which allows me to plug this into my 110 outlet. Now I'm kind of deciding how deep I want to go into this thing to get it cleaned up. It's really not too bad, just a little dusty. I pulled all the fans, they're really dusty, so I'll get those brushed off for sure. I think what I'm gonna do is just break loose some of this dust, brush it a little bit, and then blow it out. And I think I'm going to call it a day. I think that's going to be good enough to fire this up and use it safely. And of course, what fun would it be if we weren't replacing a CMOS battery? Mm hmm. Yeah, I just decided to tip it up on its side and knock a bunch of the dirt loose and then blow it out. I think that's good enough. So I'm going to get those fans cleaned up and we'll get it all back together. Well, I didn't realize my air compressor hose was at my buddy's house. So the fans aren't perfect, but they're better than they were. Got it all hooked up here. We're gonna see if this old girl's gonna post for us locally here in the workshop. Then we'll figure out about putting it somewhere else and we can start playing with it. Turn this on. What we should hear is the power supply kick on. Yep, that's just the power supply. Uh, there it goes. <laughs> she woke up. So there it is after a very long time. We're seeing a post screen. Fans have settled down a little bit very unhappy about one of the memory boards. I think that bottom one has the 2 gig 6 of RAM, so we'll see what that's all about. Inside you can see all those diagnostic LEDs, pretty cool. All the fans are happy and healthy. This board says 53, we'll have to look up what that means. All right, it just sits at the ProLiant screen. I'm gonna pull this board that it's complaining about with the RAM for some reason and we'll boot it up again. I thought it was my capture setup, but I switched to this local monitor and it was the same story, so let's try it again. Yeah. <sighs> 
forgot to put one of these back in. Pray that's the issue. Here we go. Well, just hangs at that HP splash screen. So we will be trying the tried and true method of clearing the MVRAM with this system maintenance switch. There's a bank of maintenance switches down in there, so I'll figure out which one it is. NVRAM is set to clear itself. Let's see what happens. Interesting. So previously it had been starting itself up the moment I gave it power, and now it doesn't. So definitely some configuration was cleared. Well, let's go. Promising. Okay, this is making me feel better. <laughs> Doing some sort of memory test. Let's see. I wonder if there's anything on these drives. Let's try to net boot. All right, nothing on the hard drives. Let's reboot it, get into system setup. Well, this thing works. This board that it came with, obviously those were two gig sticks, not four gig sticks like I thought. And this board here, it's unhappy with. We'll have to figure out what's going on there. We'll be able to sort through that. In the meantime, I'm sure you've noticed this thing is an absolute ripper. So I can't be having it in here. I'll show you what I'm thinking for how I'm gonna get it set up and start using it. This is how I have to transport it, take all its parts out. Easily the heaviest server I own, almost a two man job. Got the ProLiant set up in an adjacent room where I keep my server rack. And in here, I've got this Dell PowerEdge KVM that I've been enjoying and having a lot of luck with running the servers in the other room from here in relative peace. So the way this works is I'm able to have a local VGA monitor, which I actually pass through to a capture card for you all on YouTube, very convenient, and then mouse and keyboard, and then I can control up to 16 machines with these RJ45 ports. The deal with that is they've got these SIP server interface pods. You have this on the machine side, obviously on VGA mouse and keyboard, and then you just have a simple RJ45 connection to one of the ports on this guy, and you can control up to 16 machines that way. Obviously, the more machines I add, the more ethernet lines I have to dedicate going that way. I have a trunk of 15 of them going over to the server room, and I've already dedicated two of them to this cause, but it's kind of silly, uh, it doesn't really scale. And that is why I picked up this. An expansion module. I think it's a PEM port expansion module. I can run one line from the KVM to this thing and then control eight machines on Ethernet that way. So one Ethernet line from this room to the server room. So something like this. One Ethernet line from the KVM to the expander and then as many computers SIP modules as I want, effectively, in my case, in the expander. And it's a passive unit. It doesn't require power. The KVM figures all that out. So yeah, let's get this installed piece of cake. Got the KVM coming into our extender. That's coming over here to the HP. Got the SIP hooked up. Got it on the network in its normal NIC. Got the ILO hooked up to the network. That's going to be our first port of call so that we can hopefully remotely power up and power down this thing from the other room. Extender's working. I have one of my other machines plugged into it just to see if it would work. Let's power that ProLiant on. All right, this is the name of that SIP. You store the name in the SIP I mean, let's make it official. It's 2005, guys. Let's get into that thing. We're cruising. So now, if I recall correctly from the first time I booted it, if I'm really quick, I can get into the ILO settings. Or the screen will go black. Also possible. A couple problems. My capture card doesn't like it when it leaves the boot screen. It goes blank, so I have this local monitor here. And the keyboard input is not being respected from the KVM. So I'm going to go spend a little time with that server and see if I can get it in better shape. I was actually able to get into the ILO settings really easily and see that my router had assigned it an IP. Then I went ahead and made myself an administrator user. Then I went and headed over to the smart array controller to check out the RAID setup. There was already one logical drive configured across those four physical drives in a RAID 10 or RAID 1 plus 0, giving 67.8 gigabytes of usable space. So that's good enough for me. We'll just install an OS on it that way. Then I went and took a look at all the advanced memory protection options in the BIOS, and it's actually smart enough to tell you that it can't go into certain configurations that your physical setup doesn't support. And at this point, one of the memory trays is still blinking all amber and not showing up at all. I tried all sorts of different configurations and ultimately came to the conclusion that that board is broken. Here's the board that never works even when known good RAM is inside. In fact, I tried a bunch of different combinations and all the RAM is fine. 
the other board is completely happy to accept any of it. So let's get in here and see if we can find anything egregiously wrong, perhaps some shorting on the back of the board. I think it just slides out, yeah. Doesn't smell good. <laughs> Got a little dust here. I don't think that could cause anything. Got it all cleaned up, and the only thing that's obviously wrong is it's got a bow in it. Kind of like this. And I could notice that when it was in its tray, I was trying to put the ram in, and you kind of had to spread these plastic bits a little bit to compensate for that warping. So maybe there's some structural damage to some traces internally. Externally, it seems fine, of course, except for this pretty bad bow. Yeah, what, what would cause that? Excessive heat, maybe? Very weird. I don't think the other one is like that. But I've cleaned it up. We'll, we'll rub the contacts even though they looked fine. We'll get the contact cleaner in here and we'll try it again. You never know. The board doesn't look cracked or anything due to the bowing, but maybe it's enough to start coming in contact with this plate. I'll see if I can find some plastic to slide under here. I cut up an anti-static bag to lay in there under the board just to see if the theory holds any water. Time to see if we can get into the integrated lights out manager. I'm happy to be out of that room. It was incredibly loud and incredibly hot. There's literally a furnace in there, along with the three servers that are running. You'll recall the ILO setting said it was set at 192.168.150. So let's hit that and <laughs> sure enough, ILO integrated lights out. Doesn't that seem abrupt? It's not a lights out manager, integrated lights out. I've been calling it ILO. Hopefully that's not driving anyone crazy. Maybe you're supposed to say ILO. So let's see, I made myself an administrative user. Ah, we are in. Check this out. Okay, it knows the server's off. It knows that I am Clab Retro. Let's look around a little bit. Virtual power. Very nice. So the machine is plugged in, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be able to access this. Looks like I can control the power button. We'll, we'll do that shortly. Administration settings, idle timeouts, all that sort of thing. Virtual devices, virtual media. <laughs> Not licensed. Thanks, HP. System status. Let's look at server status. Okay, cool. This looks really similar to the lights out management that came with a compact I have five years prior in 2000. So that would have been pre HP acquisition. You can see the design language is sort of similar with these horizontal bars. You'll have to trust me when I say that it feels the same as using that other interface. And if you remember the configuration utility UI when you hit F8 as the machines start up, that obviously is very, very similar aside from the naming. This thing is, is a ripper. Four three gig processors. Can't complain about that. And then down here you can see where I finally ended up. I've got one working memory module board and there are four two gig sticks in there for a total of eight see what else we got the log cool it keeps track of everything that happens power coming and going network link coming up me logging in i think that's me right now really cool the server thinks that it is november 12th 2005 and i am happy to let it think that remote console let's get in here oh okay well it's got a little tutorial this is nice it's going to tell us exactly what java we need i think i have 1.4 Ooh, okay now let's power this thing up and we should actually see the screen here. This is really cool. Just like the compact five years prior. And it still impresses me every time I see something like this. So I think we want to go to virtual power and I can give it a momentary press. See if it fires up. I can hear it. I have a camera pointed at it. Hopefully we'll see the lights turn on. Now let's go to remote console. And we should see, hopefully, something happen. Oh, here it comes. These enterprise servers, new and old, take quite a while to sort of come to life. It's saying I don't have access. Graphical remote console is an ILO advanced feature. Even though it just showed me. <laughs> so it complains a little bit about it being an advanced feature, and then it shows me this. So check this out. I don't know if you can see it. Eight gigs total. 6 gigs system memory, it says 2 gigs memory reserved for online spare. So even though we have one board, we're still able to do some interesting stuff with that memory, with the AMP features, which is really cool. Well, this blows me away every time, folks. Like, I'm watching that server in the other room boot visually with a remote console screen 
in Windows IE 7 in an XP VM via Java. Like, it doesn't get any better than this. This is computing. Enterprise computing. Do keys work? I might have been too slow. Oh, they do. Yes. I love it. Look at this. I'm in the setup. Over here in advanced memory protection, we've got online spare with advanced ECC support. Very cool. This thing is just maxed out with features and capabilities. You could spend an hour going over all this. What am I going to do with this thing? I got to do something interesting. Let's figure out what OS to put on it. Here's what I'm thinking. As I'm filming this, it's December 2023, and I'm participating in something called Advent of Code. Basically, it's an advent calendar for coding puzzles. You get two new puzzles every day. And this year, I'm doing it entirely in Perl, and I'm only letting myself use this second edition of Programming Perl as a reference. No Google, no ChatGPT, nothing, just the book. And that's got me feeling a little inspired. What we're gonna do is get a LAMP stack on this HP. LAMP stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, typically, sometimes Perl, but most of the time, PHP. LAMP was and is a popular open source stack for app development. Definitely all the rage in 2005, did a lot of LAMPing back in my day. So we'll start by getting Ubuntu 5.04 on there, came out in 2005. This will be the oldest version of Ubuntu I've ever used. I started with Dapper Drake myself in 2006. Then we'll make sure we have 2005 versions of MySQL, Apache, and PHP on there. And I think we'll install something called PHPBB. PHPBB was a really popular forum software to run back then. In fact, you probably recognize the logo and the design and feel of it. So I think it'll be really fun to throw that on there and see what it's like setting it up and running it. Simply because if someone gave me this thing in 2005, that's probably what I would have done with it. You're telling me you and all your friends didn't set up and host PHP BB forums that literally no one ever came and saw in the mid 2000s? Yeah, me neither. Let's price out one of these DL580s on HP's website from 2006. Unfortunately, the pricing page for my exact version with the 3.0 gigahertz processors did not get scraped properly, but we're going to use this 3.3 page and it'll be close enough. Starting price with two processors, 15,000 US dollars in 2005. We have four processors, so we'll add those. And if you didn't notice, that's an extra $5,699 per processor. I've got a lot of work to do on this thing, so I'm going to give it four gigs of memory on the first board. For the pleasure of owning a second memory expansion board, I'm going to pay $499. And of course, we'll throw another four gigs at that. Not made of money. We'll skip the other two boards. The boys at the office like Windows, so we'll get a five chair Windows Server 2003 license. And apparently this has extended our estimated ship date. They got to wait for it to arrive from Redmond or something. The hard drives, we have four 36.4 gig drives. We will not be including a mezzanine card, unfortunately. $49 in 2005 for a floppy drive. I don't think so. And whoever priced mine out got the slimline CD DVD ROM combo for 159 extra dollars. This brings us to a grand total of 30,000 US dollars in 2005. That's like pushing $50,000 adjusted for inflation. Now, this is list price. Maybe you get a bulk discount, but I think if you're buying one of these and you're a small business, you're spending a lot of money. Got the install media in there. We'll see what happens. It's kind of funny. Occasionally it just throws up the screen about the remote console being an advanced feature that I don't have. But as you saw, sometimes it works. Hooked up the KVM again and I'm getting video, but no keyboard input for some reason. So I'm going to have to do it on prem actually next to the server in there, unfortunately. But I wanted to show this before I did that. Look at this Ubuntu installer screen. This is not what it looks like anymore. Well, we've got it. Ubuntu 5.04 installed, went pretty smooth, all things considered. We've got SSH access. I installed SSH from the install media, which is interesting because I had to manually configure my interface and DNS. I was in the Ubuntu forums, just like the old days, back in the trenches, felt like a young man again. But we've got DNS. Obviously, we've got local network. I'm SSH'd in. Let's take a look. Ubuntu 5.04, the Hori Hedgehog release. Take a look at our hardware, sees all the memory, sees all the CPUs. Very exciting. So now let's get our LAMP stack going. 
So the next morning we're making progress. This is MySQL 5.015, came out in 2005, running on the ProLiant. So we've got the L and the M in our LAMP stack. Now we're going to move on to Apache and PHP, which I think is going to be trickier. All right, we're going to download Apache 2.2, came out at the end of 2005. Then we're going to download PHP 5.1.1, also came out end of 2005. We're going to follow some instructions on the PHP website for building both from source. And then we need to enable PHP as a module for Apache so that it knows what to do with PHP files. There are comments on this instruction page from almost 20 years ago, and I'm pretty sure they're going to come in handy. That Ubuntu install can't mount NFS. I'm missing some utilities. And the SSL version is woefully outdated. So the trick is getting stuff onto the machine without running a USB stick over there all the time. There's plenty of ways to fix that, but this is what I'm doing. Check this out. This is a folder with all the files I'm getting over there to build from source. Fire up a Python server here. Hit it with wget on the ProLiant. Bam. That's how I'm getting stuff over to this machine. Actually, I might just cheat. The install media has a bunch of packages on it. And I think it has Apache too. <laughs> yeah, screw that. I'm not building this stuff from source. All right, I'm cheating even further. I'm pointing apt at the archived old releases repositories. I could have done this to begin with, but I was trying to do stuff from source or just what I had on the install media to make sure it was for sure from 2005 and just for fun. We're just, we're just having fun. Yeah, that was effortless. Apache's installed. We've got the A in the lamp now. Get ready for this. When's the last time you saw this beautiful site powered by Apache? This is the default site that a, an Apache server will put on the server right when you install it. You've probably seen these things floating around on the internet, either a misconfigured server or someone set it up and forgot to do anything with it. Beautiful. Now, PHP. 30 dependencies later, we are compiling PHP from source. Let's write some PHP. Oh yeah, we're cruising. Doesn't that just bring you back? Mm-hmm. Some query param action going. PHP was so fun to learn web programming stuff with because you would just make your changes, refresh the page, and it was right there because it was all built into the Apache server. All right, we're lamping pretty hard here. We've got all four letters. Let's get a forum installed. Downloaded PHPB 2.0.12 from 2005, of course, and I made a folder called forum in the Apache web root. Put the PHPB tarball contents in there, and it should be as simple as hitting that forum folder. <laughs> yes. All right, we are going to get this installed. I made a database already, PHPBB. You should not set up your MySQL databases the way I am. Make myself a forum admin. Uh-oh. That's not good. Just a slight detour earlier. I lied. We were not lamping. PHP could not talk to MySQL, so I recompiled it with the right MySQL settings. And maybe we're in. Let's click finish. Ooh. I think this is my forum. Okay, it wants me to delete install and contrib. Let's do that. Ooh. <laughs> we have a forum, folks. Yes. How do I customize this bad boy? I haven't done this in probably before 2005, well over 20 years. Oh, this is so sweet. What is this? Five retro internet, big internet website. Man, this is so good. PHPB 2.0.12 in 2023. Look at these emoticons. Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm having a great time, folks. <laughs> I think I like this thing. That five minute montage of software install for you is five hours for me. So that, that was a trip down memory lane. I used to do stuff like that all the time. Super awesome to see PHBBB running again and interact with it.
A little bit of a disappointment about the broken memory board. In fact, let's talk about that for a second. I, of course, tried both boards in all the different slots, and this one never really worked. And when I got the machine, this was exhibiting the same behavior. All the RAM I've got works. That good one will accept all the RAM. The RAM sticks are completely fine. Another data point is that, of course, I was making a bunch of different changes and pulling these in and out a bunch. When you pull out the good one, these chips are warm to the touch and they were cold on this one. So that could be a hint as to what's wrong. Maybe something power related. So I'll throw this on my ever growing pile of things I need to fix. But don't worry, I've got more coming on eBay. I really want to get the mirrored setup going so that I can pull one out while the machine's running and see what happens. I hope you liked this overview of this ProLiant from 2005. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing. It means a lot to me. And if you'd really like to support the channel further, I've got a Patreon where I've got behind the scenes type videos and the occasional early release video. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.